All right, here we are preparing for the second coming, the study of first and second Thessalonians. This is lesson number one. This is the introduction part of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of this series. Um, I want to begin uh, first Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians, I want to begin talking about this, um, this particular series by reading something out of Matthew. Okay? So Matthew chapter 24, verses 42 to 44, uh, Jesus says, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think He will. I don't know about you, but when I was a child, my parents taught me to be ready for the next day. And I mean, not just you know, as a theory. It was a very concrete thing uh, that they did. Uh, school clothes had to be ready. You're not waiting until tomorrow morning to figure out what socks you're going to wear. Make sure your stuff is ready for school, homework is done. And uh, here's a quaint idea that may, uh, may be not circulating much these days. N you weren't allowed to go out after supper. Yeah, you could, after school, you, know, you go see your friends, go play ball at the park or whatever, but once after supper, that was the end of that. You weren't going anywhere after supper during the week. Why? Because you had to get ready for school the next day, whatever you had to do homework and so on and so forth. You know, you know, as a teenager, as a young guy, I would moan and whine and everybody else is out there except me. I'm the only one at home, you know, which wasn't true. You know, but anyways, I would moan and whine about that. But I am grateful to them because their early lessons helped mold my work ethic and the discipline that I uh, practice in uh, my uh, ministry and has helped me succeed in my career. When I became a Christian later on in life, I learned that this principle of preparedness was also true in Christian living as well. Same kind of attitude. As Christians, we must also prepare, but not just for tomorrow. That's why I read this passage here. We need to prepare for that day when Jesus will return, because when that day comes, there is not going to be a tomorrow. It'll be the end, boom. No time to apologize, no time to prepare. If you weren't prepared when He comes, it'll be too late. So I say all of this as a bit of an introduction for Paul's epistles to the Thessalonians, uh, which we'll be studying. These were written with the purpose of encouraging these Christians to be ready for the last day when Jesus would return. Now, it's a day that could have happened in their lifetimes, but didn't. They had to be ready because it could have happened then, but it didn't happen. So that means that the last day could happen during our lifetime. We don't think about that. We always see that as some, someone else's thing in the future, but it could happen in our lifetime. So we're going to study these letters in order to prepare ourselves should the day happen in our lifetime, because it could, why do I say that? Because Jesus says, you don't know when. He says, you know, be ready. So, since this is going to be a formal study of this first epistle, I'd like to begin with giving you uh, some introductory information about the place and the circumstances in which this congregation, you know, uh, the Thessalonian congregation, uh, was established. Good way to start a Bible study, you know, put everything in context, make sure everybody, you know, we're all on the same page when we finally get into the text. So look at this uh, map here. Thessalonica, the city. Uh, today, this is uh, today's map. Thessalonica is a modern day city in Salonika in southeastern uh, Europe. Uh, it's between Romania and Bulgaria to the north, Yugoslavia, Albania to the west. It is now, as it was in the first century, a port city in central Macedonia, Greece, on the edge of the Aegean Sea. And today it has about a half a million people in, uh, in population. In Paul's day, it was originally built in 315 BC by the Macedonian king Cassander. 
and it was named after his wife, who was Alexander the Great's half-sister. So, you know, a way to honor the boss, if you wish. In its location, Thessalonica was a natural seaport, and as a main highway route from Rome to the east, it became the largest trading center for the region of Macedonia in its day, with a population of about 200,000 at that time. And that was pretty big for a city you know, in that era to have 200,000 people. It was uh, within sight of Mount Olympus. Uh, Mount Olympus was a real mountain range that was believed to be the home of the gods in Greek mythology. And because of its location, Thessalonica became a wealthy cosmopolitan city where many cultures converged. So you had Roman and Greek and Jewish and all, all cultures came together in that city. Now because it was a center for trade, there was also a colony of Jews who lived there and who had built a synagogue in order to practice their ancient religion in the midst of this worldly and pagan and a wicked city. So it was into this city in the year 51 AD that Paul the Apostle found his way after receiving a vision or a calling from the Lord. So let's talk about this church a little bit. The church in Thessalonica was established there in approximately 51 AD, as I mentioned, while Paul was on his second missionary journey. The book of Acts recounts the events surrounding the founding of this congregation. And it's important that we know this because it will inform what Paul is saying later on. We're going to understand why he's saying what he's saying if we understand how this church was originally established. So the book of Acts recounts the events surrounding the founding of this congregation. So first, there's a vision that takes place. Paul and Silas and Timothy they're traveling, they're on their second missionary journey, and they're in the process of strengthening the churches that they've already established on the first missionary journey, when all of a sudden they have a vision or a calling. And that was Paul's method. You know, he went, established congregations, strengthened them, and then you know, he'd go back home to the home base, if you wish, to report, and then he'd leave a second time and he'd go back to the churches that he had established to strengthen them, answer their questions, you know, build them up, and so on and so forth. So he was on this type of missionary journey when he had a vision. So let's kind of read the passage here in Acts chapter 16. It says, they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them, and passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul uh, in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go ahead into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So you see the... Uh, 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 you know, the, the, the way things are working out. Paul said, you know what, we've strengthened the churches, let's break some new ground here, let's go, you know, let's go to Asia. And it says the Spirit prevented him. How, who knows, maybe the bridge was washed out. Maybe they ran out of money. More, more, more mission works are guided many times by because you've run out of money. <laughs> and you're saying, Lord, if you want me to do this, you know, give me some money, and no money comes, so you have to, who knows? But in some way, the Spirit is preventing him from you know, breaking new ground in that, in that area. So what do they do? They, they cross the Aegean Sea, and they make their way to Philippi, where through a series of events, they establish a church there. So let's read about that. It says, so pulling out uh, to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the day following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we were staying in this city some days. It says, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. 
and we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken upon, uh, to, uh, by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house. And she prevailed upon us. So later on, we're going to read that their presence and their activities in this place here where they've established a small congregation, beginning with these uh, women, uh, their presence and activities stir up a riot and they're jailed, but they're miraculously released. And after gaining their freedom, they make their way about 100 miles south and they come to the city of Thessalonica. Now Luke recounts the church being planted there along with further troubles encountered by these missionaries. So let's read that passage. It says, now when they had traveled through uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus who I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a number of leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men uh, who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there's another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received the pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. So we see that Paul uh, spent about a month there, one month. It's not a long time, you know, not even a quarter. Here we have a, you know, our quarters are three months you know, uh, for Bible study, one month. He's, he, he, he stays there teaching them you know, and so on and so forth before he's chased away to the neighboring city of Berea some 50 miles west of Thessalonica. So this was not a lot of teaching time for a new, for a new church. You see what I'm saying? I mean, uh, nowadays one of the things that happens a lot when someone becomes a Christian, there's a lot of moral teaching that takes place. You know, Christians don't do this, Christians try to avoid that kind of worldly living and so on and so forth. But here he's beginning with Jews and we're thinking that the Jews had already a lot of training in you know, virtuous living, let's put it that way. So there perhaps was less focus on that type of teaching to to bring them to a level of you know, uh, normal Christian lifestyle. It was more, who is Jesus? How is He the Messiah? How is He the promised one? Okay, th this would be the focus probably of the teaching, demonstrating that Jesus is the true Messiah from the, uh, what we would call the Old Testament, the Jews at, then, at that time simply call from their own scriptures. But even so, three weeks is not a, is not a month, it's not a very, a very long time. So Paul spends some time in Berea teaching before moving on to Athens in southern Greece and he leaves uh, Silas and uh, Timothy in this city uh, Berea and uh, he goes to Athens, he makes a few converts there and uh, he makes this famous sermon on Mars Hill to the Athenian philosophers recorded in Acts chapter 17 and soon after he leaves Athens and he heads for his final destination in Greece which is the city of Corinth. And we know Corinth, right, because we have those epistles, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, well, that was Corinth. Now, here's the, you know, the, the point here, the historical context. It is during his 18 months in Corinth that Paul wrote the two letters that he sent to the Thessalonian church. All right. So let's move ahead now and see what is the, uh, you know, what, what is the, uh, the situation that brings about his writing these two letters. Once Timothy, remember Timothy was left behind, once Timothy makes his way to Corinth 
to be with Paul, he begins to report on the progress of the young churches that they had established in the region. Okay? When it came to the Thessalon uh, Thessal uh, Thessalonica, to the church in Thessalonica, Timothy brings news that these young Christians were bearing well under the persecution that they were suffering because of their faith. He did mention, however, that several of their number had died and they were confused as to what would happen to those who died before the Lord returned. So obviously, Paul had done some teaching concerning the return of the Lord. Not only that he was the, the true Messiah according to Jewish prophecy and scripture, but also you know, his life, his death, his resurrection from the dead, certainly he taught that, that's the gospel, and apparently some material concerning his return. Not a whole lot maybe, but that this was part of God's plan that Jesus would return uh, to judge and so on and so forth. So all of a sudden, you know, uh, Paul had taught them that Jesus was to return, but they hadn't considered the idea that some of them might die before that event took place. They assumed, you know, never assumed, but they assumed, okay, Jesus is coming back, okay, you know, month or two, six months. His ministry only lasted three years, you know, so surely it's not going to take three years. And then all of a sudden grandpa dies and so-and-so dies of a disease, a baby dies at birth. You know, they're starting to ask themselves questions. So Paul, not very long after he had established this church, writes to them in order to calm their fears and to provide further instruction concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now this um, this Thessalonian letter is the earliest full discussion related to the second coming of Christ and the resurrection of the saints. It was, um, it was, the, earliest, um, it was the earliest letter written. It was the, a letter written before Revelation. I tell people sometimes, they say, oh, I want to find out about the second coming of Jesus. Well, where in Revelation do I find that? I said, no, 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 no. You don't go to Revelation to find that. You go to, you go to Thessalonians to find that, because that was the question. And Paul answers that question very clearly, almost you know, A, B, this happens, that happens, this happens, that happens. You know, very simple instruction uh, is found in his letters. So scholars have no doubts concerning the authorship of this letter, since Paul names himself in it, and historians note that it was widely distributed and accepted <clears throat> by the um, by the early church, and this was, this was two key factors in determining the authenticity and inspiration of New Testament doctrine, uh, uh, documents. When people um, began to collect the scriptures together, they tried to bring them together, the writings of the apostles and so on and so forth, they had to figure out, well, which one, you know, there was lots of material out there, you know, a lot more than the, the, the 27 books of the New Testament. There were a lot, of, a lot of people writing about Jesus, all kinds of, quote, gospels floating around. And so they wanted to know which are the genuine ones, which are the ones we will put into the, what's called the canon, where canon you know, means a measuring. You know, which ones measure up uh, to be from God, inspired from the apostles? And the criteria to decide which ones measured up, among others, was first of all, was it written by an apostle, a legitimate apostle? And number two, had that, had that uh, document circulated among the early church? Was it well known among the early church? And the reason for that is if it was well known among the early church, who better to denounce fake documents than the early church? because you had the apostles who were still alive. And so the apostles who were still alive could say, no, this is not good, this is not inspired, so on and so forth. And so we're, pretty, uh, we're in pretty good shape uh, for the authentic authenticity of first and second uh, Thessalonians. It's also a model epistle when examining the various growing pains experienced by a new church. Like in the mission field, you, know, you, you, you only have a couple of weeks to teach, which epistle am I going to teach? You know, am I going to do Romans? Am I going to do, Revel, you know, am I going to do Revel, 
uh, well, you know, if you've only got a couple of weeks, you know, uh, first and second Thessalonians be a pretty good uh, epistle to teach, especially to uh, a new church. So the Thessalonian congregation had been established and taught in the space of a few weeks. They were now facing persecution as well as confusion about the doctrine. And so Paul writes to them in order to calm their fears and also to teach them what they wanted to understand but couldn't without direct information from God. How do you figure out what's going to happen at the end? Who's going to answer that question for you? Well, you know, no human being anyways. So they look to the inspired apostle for that. All right, so the letter deals with three main themes which make up the body of the letter. And these are bookended, if you wish, by a salutation at the beginning and a, an, a, an exhortation, if you wish, and a final greeting at the end. So there are a lot of ways you know, to break up a, an epistle, you know, depending on how you're going to study it. But uh, this one here has a, a pretty straightforward uh, breakdown. First of all, Paul's prayer of thanksgiving, chapter one, verses one to 10. Then Paul defends his conduct among them. You're going to find out that he, he was only there three weeks, you know, but he was already being attacked. His credibility was being attacked. And so he gives a defense of his activity among them, chapter two, verse one to chapter three. A very long part of the epistle is devoted to that. Because what good is his teaching if the people you know, hearing him don't believe that he's a credible teacher? If in their mind they're saying, oh, he's a fake, or he's you know, really not credible, he really isn't an apostle, I mean, you know, you're just wasting your time. You know, in the church, the, the best way to split up a church, any church, a church of 10,000 or a church of 10, the best way to break that church up is, is what? Attack the leaders. Undermine the credibility of the leaders. If you do that, if you split them up, it's a piece of cake after that. So that's what was happening there. Number three, uh, Paul exhorts the Thessalonians to pure conduct. You know, some of them, you know, were pagans before, some of them Greeks. And so an exhortation to pure conduct. Then Paul reveals Jesus' uh, teaching concerning the end, the end times, if you wish. What's going to happen? And then Paul instructs the church in preparing for the end. So that's how we're going to kind of study this uh, first uh, this first epistle. So as we go through the first letter, we're going to see some things that Paul is trying to accomplish with this brief epistle. First of all, he's going to try to express his feelings. Oh, really? You know, we hear all the time, don't trust your feelings. Don't trust, you know, when it comes to religion, don't trust your feelings. Well, when it comes to doctrine, don't trust your feelings. But how do you find out the genuineness of a person if that person doesn't express their feelings to you? So in the opening section, Paul, we'll see Paul expressing his joy and gratitude for their faithfulness and their loyalty to him and to his helpers. You know, they were a young church and Paul hadn't been with them for very long, but they were faithful in a lot of ways despite the attacks leveled against them and the attacks leveled against Paul. You know, a great reward for ministers is seeing the faithfulness and growth of the members. You know, people don't go into ministry for money. You don't, you don't get rich becoming uh, a preacher. So where's the reward? Well, the reward is seeing the church grow. There's the reward. I'll tell you, nothing kills the zeal of the preacher or the missionary more than unfaithful Christians. It's why a lot of them leave to go to other places. To, you know, why are you leaving? You've been with us six years, seven years. You know? And a lot of times, unfortunately, you know, the preachers are delicate or trying to be you know, politically correct. Well, it's time to move on, blah, blah, blah. But what's really happening is, I want to go and preach somewhere where people are going to pay attention, where they're going to hear what I say and they're going to do what I say, because that's what they hired me for. They hired me to, to, to preach the word to them. So if all I get back is they're fighting me on every single point. They're getting mad at me because I'm just telling them what the word says concerning their conduct or their zeal or their, 
their devotion. If, if that's all it is, why? There's lots of people that need to hear the gospel out there. You know? So he opens his heart to them, say, but you guys, you know, Thessalonians, you guys are not like that. Secondly, he, uh, he wants to defend himself. After his departure, there were some who accused him of being insincere, being a fraud. So he has to spend time defending his conduct. You know, as I said, the best way to cause division is to attack the leaders. Three, Paul encourages them. Their new faith was being tested and they were being tempted to return to their pagan lifestyles, especially sexual impurity, because a lot of the religious activity surrounding the pagan religions was sexual. In many of their religions, uh, having sex with the uh, uh, temple prostitutes was part of the religious exercise. They, they didn't have trouble getting the guys out to church. And so that was a, that was a powerful draw to draw people back into that lifestyle. And so he exhorts them, you don't, don't be drawn back into that type of, that type of uh, behavior. Um, he also gives them further teaching. He gives them teaching in two critical areas, the details concerning the second coming of Christ. The idea here, the second coming is mentioned 20 times in two letters. <laughs> These two little letters, 20 times the return is mentioned. And also sanctified living. The second coming was the reason for the purified living of Christians. Paul explains this in more detail. How am I preparing myself for the return of Jesus? I'm purifying myself. I'm getting rid of all the junk. I'm scraping off the barnacles. I'm growing in Christ. That's how I get, that's how I get ready for that. Just like you get ready for company. What do you do if company is coming over? Well, usually, hopefully, you clean up, right? You, let's, let's sweep up, get the dishes off the... It's kind of the same thing. And then of course, the last thing, fellowship. He encourages them and sends greetings to maintain the love and fellowship between his, this group and uh, himself and these uh, young Christians. So this is some of the you know, background information to help you understand the material that we're going to study as we begin the, the series. In the meantime, some closing remarks concerning the relevance of this study for today. Why do we study this? Why should we study this? First of all, we study this epistle because in many ways it's a portrait of ourselves. You know, we're a small group. We like to think, well, we're a pretty good sized Church of Christ. You know, we got 400 people, That's it. but you know, come on. We're, we're a small group here in this big old society. And you know, we're in Oklahoma, so this is a hybrid place, you know, the Bible Belt. You know. Come to Montreal, three and a half million people, you know, 500 New Testament Christians. You, know. you want to feel small, go to these big cities. Uh, go to New York, go to Tokyo, go to Beijing. In China, they have cities we have never even heard of that have seven million people. We never even heard of these cities. Seven million people. So we're like a drop in the ocean. We're a, we're a tiny little group here. And we're surrounded by a large, secular, immoral society. Who controls the media that feeds the brains of our children? We don't. We don't. Without getting too preachy here, you know, Satan controls the media. We, we don't control that. This media that our young people are <gasps> consuming what is it, four to six hours a day on the, in front of a screen somehow? We don't control that. So it is always a temptation to return to a worldly, to a, a worldly lifestyle. So they're us in many ways. Secondly, we study this to gain a better understanding about the end of the world and the various teachings about these matters. You know, we should know what the Bible teaches about the man of lawlessness. Who is the man of lawlessness? And what is the rapture? And, and, and the tribulation? And, and what happens at the end? We need to know that. Not because it's scary, because it gives us confidence. 
we know what's going to happen. We know exactly what's going to happen, but because there's been so much teaching and so much publicity uh, you know, about false teaching on this particular matter, it's confusing to us. So we say, well, I don't even want to know about it. It'll all take care of itself. Well, it won't all take care of itself. We need to understand. Uh, if we didn't have to know it, it wouldn't be in the book. You know? it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be in the book. So we need to get a handle on these things and try to separate fact from fantasy. And many of your friends and family, so on and so forth, they believe in this other thing. So it's, it's quite an eye opener when you very clearly lay out for them what's going to happen at the end of the world. And it's understandable, it's clear. You go, oh, well that's not complicated at all. Well no, it's not that complicated. And then of course, we study to better prepare ourselves for the return of the Lord. He may come sooner or later, but we need to be ready in any case. And you know, I'm struck by what Jesus says. You know, he says, be ready for you do not know when the Son of Man will come. And you know what? He means it. You don't know. You can't tell. You know, during the Second World War, everybody thought it was going to be the end of the world because the world was at war. Hitler seemed you know, impossible to beat and so on and so forth. It must be the end of the world. They thought they could predict it. But Jesus clearly and plainly says over and over and over again, you don't know. Everything will go on just as it has always been going on. Uh, you'll be building buildings, buying houses, you'll be you know, driving your car, having babies, celebrating your, your 65th anniversary, you know, everything. There'll be a war over here and an earthquake over there and a flood over there and stuff will just be happening. And and my hand clapped there, that's exactly, how it's, that's exactly how it's going to happen. No time to take a breath. Between two breaths, everything that Jesus says through Paul here will, will take place. And that's why we need to be ready. And hopefully we'll, we'll have a good study uh, on this. Lots of other great material in First and Second Thessalonians, but we'll certainly take a look at that. Okay, that's our class for this morning. Thank you for your attention.